office is a division of the Recreation Communication Community Services De Department of the City of Jacksonville. Anita holds a BS in Family and Consumer Science Education and a Master's in Family Resource Management from Purdue University. She has 30 years of experience in various aspects of education, extension service in Indiana and Florida, and director of the Head Start program and Montessori School. She moved to Florida in 1998 to join the Duval County Extension Service where she has worked with 4-H Youth Development for four years. In 2003, she moved to her present position in educating youth and adults in money management. Anita teaches basic financial literacy topics for clients of social service agencies, conducts work site educational programs, trains social service employees to work with their clients on money issues, and organizes 20 master money mentors and approximately 100 financial education volunteers. Anita is the recipient of the National Award for the Marketing Education Programs and State Awards for Excellence in Financial Education Programming for Teens and Adults. And I think that um, her background and her experience uh, will be, uh, is perfect for the topic that we'll be covering today. Um, and Anita, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Well, we are going to talk about basic money management and, in particular, some ways that we can use a spending and saving plan, we like to call it these days, in order to take care of cash management. OK, wait a minute. We lost the circles here. There should, um, the question here is, do we have good financial health? And there should be a circle. Can you see my cursor when I use the cursor? Um, no, we can't. Does anybody want to let me yeah. know that? You can't. OK. You can't well, OK. So uh, the question is, do, we ha do you have good financial health? And um, Gutter's model says that there are three basic circles here. One is managing risk. So we generally think about um, insurance or taking care of risk by avoiding it. Um, so that's one area. Another area is saving and investing. And then the third area is cash management and credit. And so that's what this workshop is going to be about today, is um, mainly the cash management side. We'll also talk a little bit about saving. Now, once you look at those um, three areas that uh, help us with good financial health, then you need to think about, well, what resources do I need? What knowledge do I need? Um, thinking about wants and needs is how, uh, because that can vary depending upon circumstances and situations. So how does that impinge upon our financial health? And then we don't have a lot of input to the general economic status of the country or the world, and we kind of have found that out in the last couple of years uh, in a very real sense as far as um, the economic situation, the recession, um, deep recession that we've been in. But we can use some of these other ideas, managing risk, credit, saving, investing, in order to minimize the difficulties that come along with ups and downs of the economic system. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to be very, very um, down to earth and talk about why it's important to manage our money, the steps that we should take to build a budget. It's not just as simple as, OK, here's my income, here's my expenses, OK, I'm done. Um, that might be fine for a loan application, but it doesn't help us to really manage our money. So there are more steps to that. And it actually, those steps building up to writing that plan are more important, really, in making it work for you than um, than the actual writing it down, although that is important. Uh, techniques and tools that will help us. Uh, we're going to focus on a 
calendar approach to tracking our expenses. And then look at spending gaps, leaks, and habits. And um, because you're all in a situation where you will be helping others with this information, um, be aware that I'll, I'm going to talk with you as though you could be helped by this information, but I'll also be throwing in some information about where I get my resources and why I've used them and where you can find them later on. So why should we have a spending and saving plan? And I do like to call it a spending saving plan as much as possible, although you know we have habits of calling it a budget. Because budget sounds to me like, oh, I'm on a diet. And I don't like diets. I would like to have a plan about what to, how to manage my money. So this tells us, if we have a spending and saving plan, that we're going to spend most of our money. We're going to plan right up front for saving some of it. and the fact that we have a plan means that we're writing something down on paper. Research tells us that that spending and saving plan is the most important thing that successful money managers do. And so it's either on paper, it's on a computer, it's some way that we're not just letting it run around in our head, uh, we're actually putting it down so we can add and subtract the numbers and, and keep track of things. So what happens? Well, it helps us reduce stress. I know many of us have probably gone through times in our lives where we've stayed awake at night wondering how certain bills are going to be paid or how we're going to take care of some particular money issue. So if we've at least got the basics down on paper or in the computer and we're following along, it can go a long way to reducing stress. It helps us to avoid debt. Uh, along with this plan, we're also heavily talking about tracking. So it's record keeping. We're keeping our own records. We're uh, relying on banks and credit unions to keep records. That will help us into the future. Um, we can also really define our goals and head towards them. And another really good reason for managing our money well is to set a good example for others around us, in our job, our colleagues, and also for our children. Um, we teach another class, and I think we've actually I've actually uh, done that on this uh, webinar series, um, raising a money smart kid. And so having them see you manage well is very, very important over time. So the spending plan process is really a circular process. Uh, we start out with determining our values, the things that are really, really, really important to us. Sometimes we know those right off the top of our head. Sometimes we have to think about them a little bit. We need to think about needs and wants. And we're also going to talk a little bit about habitudes, which is um, a new little uh, program that we've started to do here in Florida. And we're going to touch on that a little bit to give you an idea of what a habitude is and how that uh, affects what we call the soft side of budgeting, our spending and saving planning. The second is to track our money. And of course, we're saying track it with the UF Money Management Calendar. and um, you should have the 2012 version as a PDF in the resources that you'll be sent. Um, and then you can contact us if you like using it um, for the 2013 version. Any calendar works. So you can get one at Burger King in uh, January, February. They usually hand them out around here. And uh, you do the same thing. This one's just a little more sophisticated. Then you need to set some SMART goals. You need to set some financial goals. Many of you have used SMART goals in a lot of areas of your life. SMART goals are fantastic for finance because um, money's involved and you know when you got there. If you've got the money that you intended to save or have for a particular purpose, um, then you know that it's measurable and you've gotten there. So, so we'll talk about that and a way to do that. Um, you need then to determine your income and write down your spending and saving amounts by category. So you can see that we go through three steps before we even get to writing things down. 
Um, and then six is to track actual uh, expenses and adjust them as needed. So things can happen. Uh, great things can happen. You can have a baby. That's great. But wow, we better be changing how how we manage our money at that point because if we continue to go out to eat like we did as a single couple and um, spend money on ourselves uh, to the extent that that there's not enough to buy all the things that are needed for babies um, we're going to be in trouble pretty soon we'll be amassing what we call lifestyle debt so we have to make some changes and that's what then sends us back into uh, step one and reevaluating things um, not so good things can happen we might be cut back on hours lose a job uh, even if we have unemployment so there's still money coming in again we have to make those changes at that point to get back on track so let's first talk about values, needs, and wants. So value is something that is truly, truly important to you. And if you've got a piece of paper there, I'd like for you personally right now to just jot down what do you think are the most important things for you to spend your money on. Now, not all values require money, but look at it this way. If you say close family relationships is an important value for you then you're probably going to have to put some money in there for that to promote close family relationships maybe some of your family's not in town you need to have in your budget occasional trips to see everybody you may need to have a uh, long distance um, on your phone to make sure that you can keep in touch um, Close family relationships usually mean acknowledging birthdays and anniversaries and having gifts at Christmas time. So your, va your value should be in your spending and saving plan. So if you've written down a few, so they might be that, it might be practicing religion, it might be um, uh, being healthy, looking good. What are the things that are most important to you? When you get to the point of uh, a written budget, then you need to go back and look at what you wrote down at this point and see is that represented in our spending and saving plan. Also, right now, write down a few things that you spent money on in the last, um, let's say the last month. Just take a minute here. Write it on paper. Write it in the chat, chat box. Those things that you spent money on are examples of needs and wants. So needs are things that we can't do without. They have some aspect of survival. And then wants, everything else. Take a look at what you wrote. Did it, did it fall under one of our basic needs like shelter, food, clothing, transportation, health care? And even, let's take a look at food, for example. Food is a need. We have to have good nutrition. But when we go to the grocery store, not everything there is a need. We can go down through the junk food aisle and pick up wants. We can even want steak, but our nutritional need could be fulfilled by hamburger or peanut butter. So we need to think about how do we fulfill those needs and wants. Clothing. We better not be running around naked, <laughs> but clothing can move fairly quickly in our culture to a want. Uh, once we have enough clothes to make it to the next wash day or we have enough clothing to uh, do the basics for different types of functions we have to go to, then other things become wants once we have enough. Also, and if you have teens, you know this really, really well, if um, they may want a particular brand of clothing or other um, shoes. So that will also pretty quickly move us into um, a want situation. We often have a discussion. I use this little activity and I ask people to write down five things and then we discuss 
the actual items they've written down. And often gas or car payment comes up under transportation. So we have a discussion. Is this, is that car or that car payment a need or a want? Many times um, how we take care of transportation can be a want. And it's influenced by our individual situation, where we live, what culture we're in. An example of culture would be, you know, there are lots of people around the world that live without phone service. But in our culture, it's pretty much an expectation to have some basic way for people to get a hold of us, especially if we have children and they're off to school during the day. Um, it's expected that you can be uh, reached. Uh, in the area of shelter, um, it's expected, even though some people around the world don't have um, electricity and the greatest water situation, in our culture, you need to have that because if you don't, uh, your children can be at risk. So sometimes we have to get to the real basics of needs and wants and have that discussion again so that people start thinking about is this a need or a want as we make a choice? Uh, the dollar decision card from the Idaho Extension uh, Dollar Decisions Program is a, one that people love to get. So we copy those off and uh, give them out at programs. And this is something that we put in a bright color. And it's something that, that in size fits in a wallet. And I believe we. I um, included that as one of the resources so that you've got the basic that you can um, make and cut up and give to people that it might be appropriate for and maybe you would like to use it yourself. It's blank on the back side so you can write one, some of your goals on the back side. So do you, is it going to meet one of your goals, this purchase that we're looking at buying right now? because we've put this card now where our cash or where our card, our debit or credit card is. Can we afford it? It reminds us of this discussion or class that we're in right now. What do I have to give up to have it? What's the opportunity cost? Am I buying this on sale? Uh, am I buying it only because it's on sale? At this point, I usually have to raise my hand and say, yeah, that was a problem that I had because I would do the one that's down a little farther. Um, I would be depressed or bored, bored most, mostly, and say, oh, let's, uh, let's just mess around at Walmart. Let's go to the mall and let's do some window shopping. But it was really hard for me to pass up a sale. Um, Surely I needed that third red top just because it was on sale. It was such a great deal. Um, men, most of us today use credit cards or debit cards versus cash when we purchase items. But uh, it's so easy to swipe that card that and cash generally tells us when we're done. So thinking about it in that terms might help us to determine is this a need or a want. And would you come back tomorrow to buy this? Uh, my mom had three girls, teenage girls in the house all at the same time. So uh, when we would go shopping, and it seems like it was always for clothes, uh, that there came a time when she would say, well, we'll come back tomorrow. So she, so she wanted us all to think, do we really want this? Do we really need this? Can we give it a 24-hour break before we make that? choice. And then again, credit cards. Do we have a balance? Do we keep a balance? Do we roll it over? That's how we get lifestyle debt. Can we um, only put on that card if we're using it for convenience sakes? What we know we can pay off at the uh, when the bill comes. Another aspect of thinking about all of these things that we need to think about before we put things on paper. Um, we need to think about our money personality. And there's lots of quizzes available. Um, smartaboutmoney.org, the NEFI site has one. Uh, I'm sure you've seen many money attitude scales. Um, there's one that's been around for a few years called Money Habitudes that I'd like to kind of share with you today. 
um, well, here's the site, the NEFI site for Smart About Money, and you can you see that you ask uh, you answer a question, and then they'll give you uh, some information about your money style at the end. But money habitudes, uh, here's Sybil Solomon's site, um, and it's a card game. And here's what happens. Uh, each person gets cards, and you can have use the whole deck, but I've also talked with them, and they said we can you can split the deck in half carefully, making sure there's a representative number of cards from each of the six um, uh, money styles or money habitudes in each deck. So that's what I do. I split that deck in half because most of the time I'm using this as a part of something like this program. So they have a card that says, that's me. They have another one that says, that's not me. And they have a card that says, that's partially true or sometimes me. You're going to lay those out like they were the aces in solitaire. Then uh, what you see here are the is the logo side of the six um, ha money habitudes. But on the other side, there are statements. So you quickly read the statements and put them in the appropriate pile. And if you had the whole deck, you want to have 12 to 15. If you have a half deck, about 10 cards in the That's Me pile. Then you sort the That's Me pile into the by the logo. So you've turned them over and sorted them by logo. And your dominant style, which is what you're trying to come up with, is the one with the most cards. Now, since we can't pay the card game on the webinar, what I'd like for, like to do here is to just go through and talk about the six styles. Um, you can probably think about your own behaviors and your and those of those the behaviors of those around you, um, and come up with what you think might, might be your dominant style. So for a spontaneous folk person, um, money encourages you to enjoy the moment. That might be your motto. And others see you as spontaneous, fun-loving, or they might see you as impulsive and unconcerned with consequences. So here are the advantages, and every style has advantages and disadvantages. Um, usually the spontaneous person is the person that takes risks, not only in money, but in other areas of their life. So they're fun to be around. Um, they're quick to respond to opportunities. And they are uh, do, they may do more impulse buying than other styles. The disadvantages is that you might spend money. Disadvantages are you might spend money even when you don't have it. You might go into debt. And you uh, might have more difficulty having a uh, re reserve fund. So free spirit person says, well, at least they're thinking this. Money isn't a priority. Just let life happen. So you might be looked at as easygoing and carefree or immature and irresponsible. Advantages might be that you have faith that others are going to pro provide uh, prov uh, you are not distracted by money considerations or other or those kind of details. But disadvantages, you might feel trapped or obligated by being supported. Um, maybe you're in this situation. Uh, you have a free spirit because you lack some skills or information to be able to make wise choices. Um, Status is another money habitude. And obviously, money uh, habitude is a combination of habits and attitudes about money. So money helps the person with the, the main uh, dominant, stata, dominant style of status to present a positive image. And others see you as generous or impress and impressive, or maybe superficial and insensitive. Um, advantages, we have a strong first impression. Um, general. Usually, this person makes generous donations, uh, might give expensive or unexpected gifts. Disadvantages might be that you yourself know that the impression is there, but you might be low on um, savings accounts um, or having real wealth. And you might be the one that feels constant stress in keeping up with the Joneses. Selfless. Um, folks say, money helps me feel good by giving to others. 
So others see you as sacrificing or charitable or maybe judgmental and a martyr. So you have strong values and convictions. You're dependent upon by others. You give generously. But disadvantages might be that you feel guilty or angry if money is spent on personal pleasure. Even when you do it or as you observe others do it, you might also become uh, judgmental when others are frivolous with their money. Security, somebody with security uh, as a dominant style says money helps me feel safe, secure, and in control. So you might be considered thrifty or organized or miserly and cheap. Uh, usually this person has a, fi a budget, a financial plan. They have savings. They shop wisely. Uh, they have emergency fund. But sometimes they get into savings so much that they may not be taking care of today's needs and wants. Um, the investment choices might be so safe that they may not be getting growth over the long term. And um, because it's not a part of your plan, you might not be able to even take advantage of unexpected sales or opportunities. Targeted goal folks say money helps me achieve my goals. So others see you as responsible and accomplished or maybe too driven, too conservative. Um, the advantages are that you're making intentional decisions. You've got long-term outcomes, uh, long-term goals. Um, you're, you have generally um, uh, an emergency fund, a sense of well-being and control. But disadvantages might be that you feel pressured by others to spend money where it doesn't fit your values. Um, you might be the one in the family that's the go-to person when uh, things don't go wrong for those who or don't go right for those who didn't plan. And you might also have op opportunity issues. Uh, it's not a part of my plan. Oh my gosh, I can't take advantage of that unless you really, really, really think it over hard. So if you've recognized yourself, write down what you think your um, dominant style might be. Think of other folks in your family that and what that might be for them. So as you were, we were going through, through those, did you have an eye-opening moment about your style? Um, did you, an aha moment we say, um, how might um, your money habitudes or money habitudes in general have a bearing on whether you're saving, whether you're investing, whether you're managing debt? How might your money habitudes conflict with other family members. For instance, if you are a targeted goal and your spouse or significant other is a free spirit, you can see that conflict is going to be almost automatic unless you can understand that there can be balance in life and each of you are respectful of each other's um, main dominance and if target developing wealth but if you are both of you are on the uh, more the end of more uh, free spirit and spontaneous you may not have so much conflict but there may not be any money uh, in an emergency fund and you may um, be may even have some conflict over why is there enough money to pay the bills uh, now the question then becomes, and hopefully you're discussing here on the side um, some of these questions. The the question becomes, as a, a child, a teen, a young adult, to become one of these major styles, and it is helping me to achieve my goals, to uh, have financial health. Then we're in your in a good place. If it's not helping you, can you make changes to your style? And yes, the answer is yes, you can. So we're going to run through those same styles again and just quickly look at ways to create more balance. Um, 
if you're spontaneous and you recognize yourself in any of those disadvantages, um, this activity helps you to think of making a list of alternative activities to going shopping, plan to do them with other people, get rid of store cards, keep one major card, leave it at home, pay with cash, use direct deposit, pay online bill pay, save a set amount weekly. If you're a free spirit and you noticed that in the disadvantages you would like to make some changes, then creating more balance might be um, that you take a a workshop that you um, know the realistic expenses even if somebody else is paying them understand what's happening and then determine if you're being fairly compensated for your work a free spirit might just say oh my job is my job they pay me what they want but um, you may need to be thinking about the income side here if status was your dominant, you could create more balance by shopping for quality instead of name brands, uh, limit to some percent, maybe 10% your trendy purchases so that they don't, um, you buy a whole lot of trendy clothes and have to replace your, um, feel like you need to replace your uh, clothes every season or every year. Um, if going into a store causes you to spend more money, maybe shopping online would help. Um, setting up that spending and saving plan might help. If you're selfless, know how much you are giving away and identify how much uh, you want to give. Stick to your plan. Have a giving plan. Uh, plan activities for personal enjoyment that don't involve your favorite charities. Sometimes we, this type of person, uh, that might be their fun events is charities where, um, where it's expected that money be given away. Um, before giving monetary help to others, consider are you enabling them or are you um, helping them to be responsible? If security is your dominant and you noticed any disadvantages, you can create more balance by um, reassessing your budget to make sure there's fun, there's gifts, there's some spontaneous opportunities within your budget. Um, remember the security person might have trouble, they might stick to savings options only rather than doing some investing if they have a long-term horizon. So doing some classes, finding out more about how you can manage risk and still um, invest. If you were targeted goal and you saw yourself in some of these of the disadvantages, then learn more effective communication skills so that when you feel pressured, you're able to decide, do I want to make that uh, do what they are pressuring me to do or not. Um, but sometimes you may have to step out of your comfort zone and take some risks, uh, make some ch some spontaneous decisions. And uh, target goal folks may be intolerant of other folks that don't have target have goals. So we may learn, and I'm speaking here myself, uh, to being more tolerant and patient with people who might have a lifestyle or values that are different from ours. Okay, so we've talked about needs, wants, money habitudes. Now let's set some SMART goals. Um, goals help us, writing them down, help us know when we've gotten where we want to go. So many of us have used SMART goals before in all other areas of our life, but they're fabulous for financial goals. And I love this SMART goal chart. You've probably seen it in other extension materials that you might have used. And it is included in page three of our money management calendar. So a SMART goal is specific, measurable, adaptable, realistic, and timely. So let's Let's look at the chart and the example. Our goal here is that we want to buy a 50-inch LCD TV. So this is a purchase goal. Um, SMART goals work best for things that we are going to purchase or accumulate money over time. If we're going to pay off debt and it has still has an interest rate 
attached to it. A better program to use is PowerPay at PowerPay.org. And there's no www in front of that. It's PowerPay.org. It's an extension program also. Um, if it's debt that you're trying to pay off that does not have an accumulating um, interest amount, then you could use this. Okay, so let's say we want to buy that TV. Um, because we've been specific, we've been able to go out and do some comparison shopping, and we know that the one we want is $600. So we're going to save toward it by starting in uh, June, and we're going to buy it in November. That tells us that we have six months, so we divide six into 600, and we have $100 per month that we need to save. We can break that down to, well, that's $25 a week, that's $50 for my pay, for my pay period. If $100 works, and we test that by um, maybe doing a, a gut check, or maybe we've got our spending and saving plan mostly put together, we can drop it in as a savings item and see if it fits. Um, we want to find out at this point, is it realistic? Can I save that amount of money? If we can, then we, we go along and put that automatically out of our paycheck, 50 bucks if it's every two weeks, um, into our account so that we know we'll have it, we'll be successful. But if not, if our gut reaction or it doesn't fit, then there are a couple of things we can do um, with the chart. And so we would start another line and then we would say, well, okay, let's take the amount of the, let's say we're going to change it to a smaller TV or we're going to find a cheaper brand. We're going to drop that down to $300 because we still want to have it by November. If we go through that, then we find out that in that six months, um, the answer is $50. And maybe that's going to work for us per month. Uh, another thing we can do is change those dates. Um, you know, I don't need it by November. So let's go out 12 months, go from June to June. And um, again, we're at that $50 amount per month, $12, about 12 bucks a week or $25 every two, two weeks of pay period. That tells us that we can adapt some of our savings goals. And we may even need to adapt uh, and find be able to see whether we can find that money in our grocery shopping um, budget category or our recreation category. So once we do this, we want to make sure that we can be successful. Nothing worse than saying, I want to buy a 50-inch LCD TV by Christmas, and uh, we start putting back a few bucks every week, not really enough to make it happen. And then when we get to Christmas time, uh, we can't afford it. And then we start saying, well, I'm not a saver. I'm just a spender. This, this saving thing doesn't work for me. Um, we need to make sure, pretty sure, that we can be successful, barring a major catastrophe in our lives, um, to be able to do that in that time period. So we've got not only the goal, but the action plan that goes along with it. So let's talk about rainy day fund. How much money should we have in an emergency fund? Um, it, it, we hear things all the way from one month to a year uh, of our major expenses. And that has something to do with how quickly, if you lost your job, do you really think you'll be able to turn around and find one? And that might have something to do whether it's an, a regular, quote, quote, normal economy, or um, you're trying to plan for the abnormal economy. It's taken people in this recession much longer than they thought to find a new job. Um, but we would fill that out. So. You know, what do we think should be in that rainy day fund? It's better to have a goal amount than to just say, oh, I'll pop a few dollars in every once in a while. That way we know when we've got there, when we have enough, when we can feel secure. Uh, and then we would fill out. And this may be a long-term process. We base it on our income and our expenses, but uh, we use it when the car breaks down. 
Um, we use it when the refrigerator breaks. Um, but having the goal amount then tells us, okay, we've got to redouble our efforts, get that money back in there uh, so that we still have a rainy day fund. So as we put that savings into our spending plan, we have the choice. Do we can spend all of our money right now? or we can put a savings, a couple of savings accounts together actually and have uh, security for the future. So we can have that emergency fund. We can also have what we call a put and pull account, uh, money that um, we set aside based on our occasional and periodic expenses. And the way to really make this happen is to set up an automatic withdrawal from our paycheck to a uh, a savings account of our choice. All right, now we're getting down to putting some numbers on paper and uh, the form. In the UF money management calendar, on page four, there's a little box to be able to figure out your income. So basically what we're, we're going to do is a monthly budget. You can do a spending and saving plan based on a week, a month, a year. Most of us do it monthly. Why? Well, because most of our major bills come monthly. So if we got that covered and we know and we can put an amount down for other flexible expenses, um, we've, we have a good plan. So what's our salary? Do we have uh, tips and commissions? If it does if we have tips and commissions and it's not always set how much money we have every month then we just have to plan with what we know so if it if we have tips and commissions it can vary take the average of the last 3 to 6 months or take the lowest amount that you earned in the last 3 to 6 months Obviously, the lowest amount is the most conservative way to do it. If you can make it on your lowest amount, you can make it. And then the additional you can put in savings or that's the, month, that's the time that you can um, do a little extra recreation or other uh, options there. The average, there will be times when you're low and times when you have more. Um, if, if it doesn't vary by much, do the average. If it varies quite a bit, try to make it on the lowest amount. So now we need to track our current behavior. So we lead, need to list monthly bills and amounts. And that's pretty easy for us to come up with. We just find an old copy of bills. But the flexible expenses, like food and clothing, we may need to track for a month to see where that money's going. So a couple ways to do that, take a piece of paper and just fold it in half once, fold it in half twice, fold it in half three times. When you open it back up you've got eight spots and um, you can label them Sunday through Saturday and the last one can be your shopping list or a uh, place to calculate things. But what you're going to do then is fold it back down find a little cheap pencil that fits in there and um, each day is is folded on the outside so on Sunday what did you spend money on where'd you go what was it um, if it's a blank sheet of paper on both sides you've got two weeks now that at the end of two weeks you can sit down and say okay how did I spend my money it's even broken out by date so you can kind of get an idea who was I with on Saturday when I spent all that money um, are they helping me or hindering me um, so we're looking at what do we spend um, on our flexible expenses another way is to just keep receipts bring them home um, categorize them and put them in a little notebook um, and there is a flexible and occasional expense chart in the money management calendar. That's what makes it really uh, a great option over a plain old calendar because with each month there's a, a, a spreadsheet uh, so that is uh, categories across the top, uh, dates down on the side so that you can fill in the information. 
So now we're going to organize those expenses. Fixed expenses are the ones that come every month, about the same time they're due, about the same amount. Um, but the deal is there's a big consequence. If you don't pay this particular item, um, something's going to happen. Don't pay the rent, you're, you will be out on the street. Don't pay your car payment, it gets repossessed eventually, maybe quicker than you'd like. Um, it has to do with a contract. If you don't pay your um, credit card bill, um, there are credit issues that will come to plague you. So fixed expenses are the ones that float to the top and we usually have bills or things that we can uh, readily find out how much that's going to be. Flexible expenses are the ones that every day the little decisions we make have a bearing on whether we spend a little or a lot. And in fact, the, flex the decisions we make on our flexible expenses have a stronger bearing uh, on our long-term wealth, our long-term financial health, um, than even making those investment decisions. Occasional expenses are the ones that we forget when we're doing a monthly budget. So we have to have some way to account for those. So you either need a chart like is in uh, this calendar we're talking about, or when you have a calendar, you go go in and go and fill in. Okay, I'm paying um, my insurance on the six months, so fill it in on the months that I need to pay that. Um, or I pay my uh, property insurance myself, and it's once a year. Um, we know when Christmas is coming, so we can fill that in. We know when anniversaries come, so we can fill that in. And then. Um, we need to write that down. The more we can write down or put it down in the computer, the better, getting into that habit. Now we're ready to write the plan and putting those items down on a single sheet of paper or in the money management calendar, there's a couple of different charts you fill in. You also fill in the amount you intend to save for your goals and your rainy day fund. If you have occasional expenses, and we all do, and those are the ones that I kind of call the budget busters, they're the ones that when they come, you tend to spend the money on it because you need to or you want to, um, and then maybe another bill won't get paid. So if we can identify those occasional expenses, add them up for the year, divide by 12, and put them in what we would call a put and pull account. We're going to put money in there. It's not going to stay very long. We're going to pull it out when we're going to use the money for that item. Remember, these occasional expenses are not emergencies. And most of us would be better served by having a separate emergency fund, the fund that's going, the money's going to stay there except for real emergencies, and then the occasional put and pull account put in pull account for the expenses that um, we know they're going to happen and so the money's going to be there because we've saved ahead a little bit. Sort of like an escrow account for taxes and insurance, but we're doing it ourselves. So once you've got things down on paper, we want to find out are we positive or negative. So when we're planning, and we know this doesn't work in real life. It never comes out to zero. But when we're planning, if we zero base budget, income minus expense equals zero, it has these advantages. If we come up with a positive amount, that's fabulous. However, um, what's going to happen to that 70 bucks, that 120 bucks, that 500 bucks, whatever it is that we're not putting in a category at this present moment. What's going to happen to that? Well, it's just going to disappear. And it might not be spent where we would really want it to be spent. So this is the time to decide. Am I going to put it all in savings? Am I going to put a little bit in savings? Am I going to put some in uh, recreation? Am I going to have um, a, a more expensive diet, put some more in groceries? Am I going to buy a few more outfits or clothes for myself or the kids. Where are we going to put that money um, so that it will go to further my values, my needs, and my wants? 
if it's if we come up negative, wow, now's the time we have to make the hard choices. And it's interesting in that people who have not actually sat down to do this, income on one side, expenses on the other, subtract the two, uh, subtract the expenses from the income, not really realizing that we're in the hole every month. If we're in the hole every month, that's how we get lifestyle credit card debt. Uh, because $50 this month in the hole doesn't seem like a lot. But if you're in the hole this month, then we've put it on the credit card just to manage it. Next month, we're going to do the same thing. So now, instead of having $50 in the hole, now we're $100 in the hole, and on and on and on. And so that's how that credit card debt just kind of creeps up on us. So if we do have to find money somehow, we've got two choices, increase income and resources or decrease expenses. So let's talk about income first. It's not always easy to find more income. So let's talk about some ways that might happen, and then we'll talk about the expense side. Can you find, can you get a second job? Does somebody else in your family need to get a job in order to make ends meet? Do you need to prove your worth? and Talk to your boss about getting a raise. Um, do you need to just bite the bullet and start getting that resume ready and start to find a better job? Um, are you the one, if there's overtime there, that you volunteer to work overtime? And the good thing about that is if you know how much in the hole you're going to be, you know how much overtime you need to ask for every month. Now, again, that's up and down, so it may not serve you over the long haul. Uh, but it's something to look at for the short term. Um, sharing housing expenses with a roommate or s someone else who is helping you to handle expenses might help, help you increase income. This might be a time to start looking at um, are your taxes being done appropriately? Um, are you, do you need to get new degrees or licenses or certifications? Should you if, do you get a huge, not huge, do you get, do you get a large um, refund in January? Do you kind of count on that? If so, maybe this is time to um, cautiously look at how many exemptions you have um, on your coming out of your paychecks or with your paycheck associated with it so that you don't have a huge um, refund, that you're getting that money as the months go by to help balance your budget. You know, another reason that came about this year for not having large uh, refunds is that there's a huge issue now with um, identity theft and people um, pretending to be you and getting your refund. And the IRS doesn't have a really good way to take care of that right now. So if somebody else beats you to the punch, you don't get your refund probably from uh, six months to 18 months in the future. So be careful and watch for that for several reasons. Of course, if you need other assistance to make ends meet, um, take a look at housing assistance, uh, children's health insurance programs, food stamps, other types of assistance. If you have a 211, uh, we have one in our area that's funded by United Way. Uh, look for that. Uh, and in fact, um, we're even, through the University of Florida, developing a database through a grant service to help help us serve the whole state. So look for those kinds of um, s services. Do, are the state benefits in your state automated? Are they online? Can you go and um, do, like ours, is Access Florida? Can you go online and find out without having to go in and sit down with somebody um, whether your uh, energy assistance or food stamps, whether you can qualify for that? The rest of these um, you'll find in lots of publications that have to do with um, uh, managing in tough times or um, just entering into discussions. And this is one of the big discussion areas, the times that I uh, discuss. And it's amazing how we teach each other to save money. So think about reducing or eliminating some of our 
wants, sticking to the needs if that's necessary. We might need to learn how to do some repairs ourselves, um, bartering or trade, trading services. Babysitting co-ops is a good example of that, or carpooling. Um, look around for extension publications. Uh, go to your various extension um, state sites and look for the publication section. Um, we have a really good one on grocery shopping and some other uh, how to manage your money at the grocery store. And I give one of those out at the workshops that I give. And the first one always is take a list. And then it talks about all the reasons why taking a list is helpful. It means you've already checked the pantry and you're not going to buy another thing of ketchup because you don't know whether you've got it or not. Um, You've done a little bit of planning with ads and decided what you're going to eat that week. Also, my next one is don't go when you're hungry. And my third one is um, don't take other people with you because it is distracting and they tend to put stuff in the cart you weren't planning to buy. So be careful who you take with you. We have um, our, our utility company here is JEA and we, they have a great handout aimed at one aimed at renters, one aimed at uh, own homeowners, um, sev several different versions of it, um, it, and it's written very consumer friendly. So look around at your utility company and see if they have handouts to help you talk about electric and water um, and think about how to save. Uh, here in Florida, air conditioning is our major issue, so we talk a lot about trying to keep the thermostat on 78 because that's about half of your electrical use is um, that air conditioning. Um, look for extension publications uh, too on saving in electric and water. Besides housing, those tend to be the ones that are the biggest ones that we can make a dent in. But also look at the little things. Um, can you simplify? Simplify just means you're going to cut some stuff out. Share means you're going to um, look at carpooling or some other ways that other people can help you out. You help them, they can help you. And, and then substitute really the biggest list um, of finding less expensive ways, like instead of eating out, take your lunch. Um, and of course, conserving energy is becoming uh, a big topic in and of itself to save money. And if you're adding your own as you go, as we're going through here, that's great because we all learn from each other. You know, do you need um, a landline and a cell phone? How do you get your communication device the least expensive way for the best quality? Are you comparing prices? Do you use coupons, but do you use them wisely? Do you compare them with the because coupons are always for na name brand products, do you compare them with the generic in the store? Generic products are the fastest growing area. Are you using advertising to help you make good choices or do you give in to it? Um, do you think ahead about your needs? Um, do you take care of what you have? Another little um, tip here would be to take a look at how much do Americans on average spend in various categories. Now this is a range and it is saying what is average. So let's take a look at housing for instance. That uh, range is anywhere from 32 to 42 percent. In other words, what you spend in that category based on your uh, take home. Um, what is that, per what is your percent? Then you can tell Am I in that range? Am I low? Am I high? Uh, if I'm high, is that an area where I could take a look at? Um, it's hard to make changes in fixed expenses because a lot of times we have contracts that we've entered into and we have to wait a while to get out of the contract or in the area of housing, you know, a lot of refinancing has been going on lately. Um, we spend 
percentage-wise less for food in the United States on average than other countries. But if your income is low, you spend a proportionally higher amount on food. So just take a look at these um, possibilities of ranges and see in your spending plan, where do you fit? So one way of looking at that is, let's say your rent was $450, your income was $1,200, that's 37.5%. Um, so is that um, within the average range? Yes, it is. Okay, so organizing the calendars uh, in the money management calendar, you're going to put in when your money comes in. Uh, you might even put in what that on that day that you're saving, automatically saving. When is your rent due? When is your when are utilities due? Phone due? Uh, maybe you even back up and say, uh, I need to pay the phone bill a certain number of days ahead. You might in, um, also uh, do like I do with I use online bill pay. When that bill comes, I just go on and sit down and schedule it at a, at a point at which I know the money is going to be there. Um, the calendar, most calendars are sort of like a, a book, uh, if you look at it sideways. Um, and so you can place your bills in there. If you're keeping that calendar at the desk, you can put your bills inside there for safekeeping so they're not forgotten left around the house. Um, paying so that there are not overdues um, ever or at least routinely. Um, making sure that you, you've thought about whether the bills do on a weekend or not and when will they accept that payment without it being overdue. You also need to match up when is my income coming in and when are my expenses due? Because we can have a piece of paper that says, yeah, technically I got enough money to pay all my bills, so I'm good. But if you don't match it up on a calendar, then you might not have enough money to pay the rent all out of that same, that one paycheck. So, or maybe a whole bunch of bills are due out of one paycheck. You're never going to meet those. You're always, and the symptom is, I'm always late on my JEA bill or, I'm always, or my electric bill. Um, it seems like I never have enough money to get groceries toward the end of the month. So that's a cash flow issue. Um, you might ask, a, once you've actually identified it, you might be able to go in and talk to somebody or talk with them over the phone to get some due dates changed so that they would uh, fit better with your uh, when your money's coming in, or obviously, um, if if your but if your spending and saving plan says you got enough money for the month, but it doesn't seem to be matching up, then it means that we just need to stick with that plan and in fact save money from a previous income where uh, to use it in the one where you're kind of overloaded. So sticking with the plan, using your spending diary, using the money management calendar, keeping receipts, using a um, uh, check register, whatever it takes, uh, a computer plan, whatever it takes to keep up with, am I staying on target? Am I overspending, underspending? What's happening? Oops. So remember we said step six was to review and revise. So we set a monthly date with ourselves or our family, those that are involved with this spending and saving plan. Be sure we add up the amounts in our flexible expense columns, add up our fixed expenses. Uh, then we're going to subtract. And did we stay within our plan? Did we go over or did we spend less? Why was that? We may then need to, if there are differences, uh, we may need, you know, were we able to save the amount that we intended to save for occasional expenses, for our emergency fund, for our goals? Has our situation changed? Is everybody still committed? 
you know, sometimes we set up a spending and saving plan and people go in our family go along with us reluctantly because it doesn't really fit our style, our money habitude. And then what happens over time is that if we're not committed, folks might um, start uh, pulling out and spending more if they've got the ability to swipe that card. So we may have to go back and think, well, was it realistic? Hey, you know, we just we thought we could save more at the grocery store. We just can't. So we've got to find that money someplace else. And then are we are we adding to our savings account? Are we decreasing our credit card debt? It does not work the first month, believe me. You're going to have to make changes and adjustments over a three to six month period of time. But stick with it. Let's look at one um, little leak um, such a scenario. Some people call this the latte factor. Some say it's missing money. But let's say you bought a Coke at the ven vending machine every day. That was a little habit you have. And you spend a dollar. If we added it all up, um, th these are days that we worked, uh, $260 a year. If we found a cheaper way, and bought it at the grocery store at 42 cents, but still had our Coke every day, that would be $105. We could actually save $155 by finding a cheaper way. Now, when we look at this, we can also say, well, we just cut it out altogether. Do we really need a Coke? Could we just run by the water fountain? If we're satisfied with that, we've cut it out. We've actually saved the whole $260. But you know what? We're not going to stick with that unless we have a reason for saving that $260. What's our goal? What do we want to do with that $260? Do we want it to be in a savings account at the end of the year? Do we want it? Um, do we want to buy a particular item with that $260? Because if we're making a behavior change, we're either cutting something out, we're changing how often we do it to save some money, or we're finding a cheaper way, we need to have a reason to stick with the, the goal um, and save it automatically. Go on and say, what would that be? A dollar a day uh, for 20 days, that's $20 a month or so that we're going to put in a savings account automatically or that we've said we're going to put into the grocery shopping budget or something. So let's take a you know it's not just that easy either. Let's take a look at the long term cost of that habit. If you had taken that remember we said over here that we would save $155 by finding a cheaper way. If we invested it and this is investment um, seven percent is investments not savings rates um, and we had it in there for five years. The total invested, the total value, and then the total that we would earn, 179. And if we pulled that out to 30 years, that's 7,000 bucks. So it's the opportunity cost that we sometimes forget to think about. Here's another example. Two dollars a day that we might be able to not spend, that's $60 a month. If we invested that, again, for 30 years, that's $157,000. So at the end of the year, um, we need to go back and take a look at our monthly figures and the money management calendar, the UF one, has charts where you can um, transfer that information and find out for the year, where I, was I over or under budgeted in various accounts. Um, that's a way to have the average monthly amounts now to use for next year's plan. It also um, helps us to go back uh, and look at tax deductible expenses. There's a chart for those in the calendar. Some of us will, it's nice to start with a manual system like this if we've not really um, managed our money in this way before. But at some point, then many of us who are computer uh, savvy like to go to some computer programs. So you might look at 
www.mint.com. Um, there's a budgeting program there, so that's online. I use Quicken. Um, I use, well, actually, I use Money, um, but they don't make they don't, Microsoft doesn't put money out anymore. So Quicken would be your next uh, bet on that. So it has a budget. It has a check, a cash register. Um, okay, so more resources. Let's talk about those real quick. Um, spending plan forms, um, uh, and these are some of the resources that I had uh, given over so that they they will be sent to you, or maybe they already were sent to you. I'm sorry, I'm not sure exactly how that worked. But um, we have a Master Money Mentor volunteer program, and we have a Fact Finder, so there's some budgeting um, sheets in there. Um, Effective Strategies, which is a um, program that I've used over time. If you go to, oh my goodness, this is the wrong. Um, something, OK. If you go to my website, which is um, http. Dot, um, you know, colon slash slash Duval, D U V A L dot U F L, no. Duval.ifas, I-F-A-S, dot U-F-L, dot E-D-U. Um, I have a set of Excel spreadsheets under the um, Fiscally Fit um, program page. Somehow, um, I lost a line in here because the other, the FDIC.gov um, relates to the Money Smart program. That's uh, a program you can use, and they have some um, I have a budgeting module called Money Matters. So this is the site for that. Quicken is a possibility. And then Elaine Courtney, who is from Okaloosa County here, uh, had an article in um, the Financial Counseling Association uh, and where she discussed some mobile apps like Wallet Money, Expense Light. Uh, I think Mint is even has a mobile. And I've looked at Page Once. But there's a, um, she has all of those reviewed and uh, are possibilities. Um, the a lot of information that I've used over time that has worked very, very well for a limited or moderate income population is dollar decisions. So here is the uh, website to get that curriculum. Um, there's a not really nice video of just regular people managing their how they manage their money, and um, the dollar decision spending card is a part of that. And there are um, you can order the full curriculum or their um, uh, publications can be downloaded for free. Here's the FDIC uh, Money Smart module page if you're actually going to be teaching. Those are some good modules, some background information, and some good modules for moderate to limited income people. So what did you learn today? Well, hopefully we covered the importance of managing money, all those those six steps to building that budget, and that the, the first three are really, really important in order to get, get you to be able to stick to that spending and saving plan. Uh, we've covered a lot of techniques and tools to help you with that, uh, including a calendar, uh, the UF calendar, but any calendar can work. Uh, we looked a, looked a little bit at spending gaps, leaks, and habits, and um, some resources you can use to help your clients. So I've pretty much used up that hour and a half. So if there are some, um, hopefully there are lots of other resources that have been chatted while we were going through this. And if there are any particular questions um, you guys think that I should answer, then I'm ready for them. OK, Dollar Decisions website. Um, is here. Also, um, I am just fine with a PDF of this going out to folks. So you'll have this uh, um, as a PDF. So you don't necessarily have to try to take down these this crazy little um, website. Um, 
if you would like to use some of this in your own um, group experiences at teaching, I would prefer that you email me. And here is, again, my email, uh, McKinney, pretty simple, at coj, that's cityofjacksonville.net. Um, that way I can, I can send you out the actual PowerPoint in PowerPoint form and um, any other information, any other backup stuff that you want. Uh, and then I can get in touch with you in, say, six months, eight months, a, a year to see if how you've used it, if it's been helpful, what feedback you have for me to improve the program. Are extension resources freely available to, for anyone to use? Most are. Um, the Dollar Decisions curriculum, is, there is a, a charge for the curriculum itself. Um, they're very inexpensive, usually. Um, so I would say, so for instance, this web, um, I'm, I'm freely sharing it with you. I just would like to have a little bit of feedback on your use. Um, there's one something about the certificate, so I think somebody else can probably answer that better than me. Um, yes. Uh, Rebroadcast is going to happen. Okay, Mike, maybe you or Michael, maybe you can answer some of these. Uh, yes, uh, hopefully everybody can hear me now okay. Um, yes, uh, we'll be giving the information on CEUs just at the very end there, so uh, there should be a slide coming up on that in just a moment. Um, again, I, uh, if, if you were uh, another question too, uh, just regarding about a rebroadcast, uh, as, as always our web conferences are recorded. Um, the link should be available to the archive on the Learn site where you saw the bios and other things already. So those should be available within the next uh, few days typically are available right away. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I think those were all the other primary questions that were there um, that were there at the moment. Um, I see a couple of folks have already gone to uh, our Duval website. When you go to the website on the left hand side, you'll see money management as a part of family and consumer sciences. Once you get to the money management site, then there's links on that first, on the money management page that says um, Fresh Start, Fiscally Fit. Uh, so you can click on Fiscally Fit to get to the effective strategies um, and entry. And then there will be a, um, the Excel spreadsheet can be downloaded from there. There's also a retirement um, Excel spreadsheet um, to there. Um, but there was another question. Oh, what was it about? Um, so hopefully you can find fiscally fit. Just get to money management and then fiscally fit. Oh, and then there was another question about um, the, you were also looking at the, my teen site. Um, the 100 page booklet refers to the high school financial planning program. And that is a NEFE program, N-E-F-E. -E. Um, that is, those are all free materials also. That's a uh, youth program, young adult program. And that booklet is available online in modules and as a full booklet. So you we would just contact NEFE, N-E-F-E dot org for that information. Okay. All right. So I'm going to give this back over to somebody. I'm going to mute. <laughs> Good.
Great. Well, thank you so much, Anita, of course, for participating. Um, as always, I know a few of you had questions, and I just wanted to make sure that everyone had all of the information we needed. So as Molly is putting in the chat window, again, just please remember to email afcceu at gmail.com with your full name and, of course, the phrase spending plan in the email. And if you can, please send this email by Friday, September 28th at 5 p.m. Uh, so we can compile all the information and make sure that all of you get credit uh, for your one and a half CEUs. So thank you again to Anita for presenting. I, as always, you did a wonderful job, Anita, and I, I see lots of great comments in there for you. Um, so I, thank you guys, of course, also for the rest of you for the great comments and resources that were shared today. And I, of course, look forward to working with you all in future web conferences. Have a wonderful afternoon.